now so it's recording so welcome everyone to this new session of the Inc of uh, digital lecture series on load c in context um so today we have the pleasure of having us a uh, speaker uh, henry jones who is uh, <clears throat> Associate Professor in law at Durham University. And this research is uh, focused primarily on history and sociality of international law. He's also worked on English property law and legal history of pedagogy. And um, um, just to mention some recent publication, he has uh, published a paper called Property, Territory, and Colonialism, an International Legal History of Enclosure for Legal Studies uh, in 2019. And then um, another paper called Lines in the Ocean, Thinking with the Sea and ter about Territory and International Law for the London Review of International Law um, in 2016. Today, he will talk about, or we'll take a new look at the Northern Sea Continental Shelf uh, cases and, and uh, explains how through this case, uh, we can see how international law produces space in particular ways. Um, before giving him the floor, just a reminder that there will be uh, after the talk, there will be room for questions, and I uh, um, ask you to post your questions in the chat, and then I will read them, read them up um, uh, to Henry so that he can he can respond. So uh, that's it. No, the, the floor is to Henry, and uh, welcome everyone, and uh, let's enjoy this this talk. Great, thank you, Vito. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so many of you for coming. Um, I'm quickly going to just share a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, nope, I'm not. Not like that. Uh, hmm. Sorry, we literally practiced making sure the screen sharing worked before uh, people came on. There we go. Um, people will speak up if they can't see that clearly, hopefully. Um, good, okay, I'll get started properly. Um, so this paper is about the North Sea Continental Shelf cases, um, but more um, fundamentally, it's about my interest in the relationship between international law and material space and the co-production of law and space and taking the North Sea Continental Shelf cases as a specific example. These cases fall into a gap between attempts to regulate the oceans. They happen at a period when the law is not clear, the technology is new and the global order is changing. In the midst of this uh, sort of I can't decide whether it's a calmness of the sea or a turbulence of the sea, but in the midst of this, the International Court of Justice sits down and considers how to own the ocean. Such a moment is particularly revealing for how international law is involved in this co-production of space. Um, and in this quote here from Judge Tanaka, you see what, what, what I'm kind of gonna, gonna get to is the central thrust of the case, but it uh, involves international law claiming the seabed as an object of international law. So let's start with the case. Um, this is a case that uh, anyone who studied international law will be familiar with. Um, indeed, it's the very first, uh, it was the topic of the very first lecture in international law that I attended as an undergraduate. Um, but we learn it as an example of sources of international law, as an interesting place to, to start by asking the question, where does international law come from? We don't study it for any authority that it has on the specific question of the continental shelf. I want to reread it from that perspective to try and make strange again something which can seem so familiar. Um, the, uh, so first of all, the historical context of the, uh, of the case. Um, in the North Sea, gas was first found in 1964, but oil was not discovered until December 1969. The North Sea Continental Shelf cases were referred to the court in February of 1967, joined together in 1968 and decided in February 1969. Alex Sude Elferink provides a masterful and exhaustive historical account of these cases. 
Before the cases were referred to the ICJ, he reveals the different interests and anxieties of the parties. Interestingly, all parties had an eye on claims to resources beyond the North Sea, meaning that some of their claims were not connected to the specifics of the North Sea. Denmark had concerns over its colonies of Greenland and the Faroe Islands. The Dutch had interests in resources connected to their territories, Suriname, the Antilles and New Guinea in particular. Germany had resisted the continental shelf regime to that point in general, fearful that it would miss out, and it also had concerns over the claims to be made for the German Democratic Republic. Then again, some concerns were directly related to the geographical context of the North Sea, such as the choice to ignore the Norwegian trough, as it was in nobody's interest to drag Norway into the dispute. Um, this, I'm sure I don't need to tell the present audience, is a uh, geographical feature, a, a, a trough of huge depth that sort of happens just off a very steep continental shelf um, off the coast of Norway. Um, Denmark had given its first concession to prospect for hydrocarbons in its territorial sea in 1962, including an option to extend the search if Danish sovereignty was extended. In the Netherlands, gas had been discovered in Groningen in 1959. When negotiations began between the different states, both the Netherlands and Denmark were caught by surprise when Germany suggested splitting the area equally between them. Also of interest is the position of other North Sea states not party to the dispute. The North Sea Continental Shelf Act of 1964 uh, saw the UK state that it was going to give effect to the Geneva Conventions on the, on the Continental Shelf, whilst never offering its own definition or any limit to the Continental Shelf nor making any specific claims. All three parties also in their negotiations beforehand made careful efforts to keep the UK out of the dispute. So let's look at the judgment. In the judgment, the court first of all starts from defining the whole seabed as consisting of continental shelf at a depth of less than 200 meters. That's not a geographical fact. As I already mentioned, there's this Norwegian trough that goes far deeper than 200 meters, but the court has already stated it or, or instantly states it as a legal fact that the whole of the North Sea seabed is less than 200 meters and is continental shelf. The majority limit themselves to the question of delimitment, delimitation, not apportionment explained as delimitation is a process which involves establishing the boundaries of an area already in principle appertaining to the coastal state and not the determination de novo of such an area. Delimitation in an equitable manner is one thing but not the same thing as awarding a just and equitable share of previously undelimited areas even though in a number of cases the results may be comparable or even identical. The court here is insisting on a lack of novelty in what is doing simply clarifying the rules for allocating the continental shelf and not making new ones. However, I think they protest a bit too much. In the very next paragraph, they say, rights of the coastal state in respect of the area of continental shelf that constitutes a natural prolongation of its land territory exist ipso facto and ab initio by virtue of its sovereignty over the land, an inherent right. Its existence can be declared but does not need to be constituted. The right does not depend on its being exercised. Suddenly, this still very new concept is made natural, inherent and automatic, something which can be, but does not need to be declared and does not need to be constituted. The continental shelf already by 1969 just is. This strikes me as an extreme statement of how sovereignty over territory works. And I struggle to find any comparable example before this. Settler colonialism at its worst still needed something like discovery, occupation, or use. The early development of the continental shelf regime was clearly weighed down by issues around extension of territory and questions of discovery, symbolic versus actual occupation, etc. The International Court of Justice broke free from all of this, saying that a state has a continental shelf even if it doesn't know it. Such reasoning continues into paragraphs 42 and 43, saying there is no necessary connection between notions of adjacency and proximity, and that the continental shelf is described as actually part of the territory over which the coastal state already has dominion, and as a prolongation and continuation of the territory. 
The court follows the parties in just ignoring the geographic fact of a massive trench far deeper than 200 meters just off Norway. All the stuff about new, uh, all of this stuff about natural prolongation goes out of the window if you look at that. The curvature of the coastline of Germany is described as an incidental special feature from which an unjustifiable difference of treatment could result. No explanation of what makes it special is given. And as noticed, this was a surprise to both Denmark and the Netherlands when Germany first raised it. A paragraph 96, right at the end of the judgment, the judges close by calling the continental shelf submerged land, finally betraying the understanding that has informed their entire judgment. Only by seeing the continental shelf this way can such strange things be said seriously at the start of the judgment. The separate opinions don't necessarily shed a huge amount more light. Uh, Bustamante Riviero emphasizes that the continental shelf is separate to the water. I mean, it, it isn't as a matter of geographical fact, it's just under the water. Uh, Judge Jessup emphasizes how novel exploitation of the continental shelf is, and this is really all about oil and gas, and that should be the focus of negotiations. I think he's onto something there. Fao de Moon questions what the continental shelf is and emphasizes that the continental shelf is a geological fact and not a legal fiction. And as I said, I think the main judgment goes in exactly the opposite direction. And Padilla Nervo focuses on clarifying why the Geneva Conventions are not binding on Germany and sort of retreats into this technical legal uh, answer. In the dissents, Koretsky held that the Geneva Convention should be applied as at least representing general principles of international law. Tanaka demands the rule of law and not, a, and not anarchy, which I think is probably a good idea, um, and first argues that the principle of equidistance is custom, and then that it can be deduced from the fundamental concept of the continental shelf, as if this geographical feature, the continental shelf, the bit of land that isn't, uh, or the, the, the the fact that there are resources at less than 200 meters depth off the coast of states somehow contains within it equitable principles. Um, Morelli argues that the apportionment of the continental shelf is automatic by equidistance and that you can negotiate from there so that this is supposed to just happen automatically. Um, Lax also goes for the Geneva Convention representing a general principle of international law and so does Judge Sorensen. Um, and this is, it's in the dissents where I suppose we find the, the uh, International Law 101 version of the North Sea Continental Shelf cases, this discussion over sources of law and, and how to find sources of law really dominates in the dissenting opinions in a way that it doesn't trouble the, the lead judgments. After the, the case, after the judgments, so um, for those who don't know, the court um, advice, sends the parties back to negotiate again. It doesn't, doesn't rule on, uh, on where the continental shelf borders are, um, but it says that a, a sort of combination of equidistance and equity should be used in negotiating. And the, the parties agree at, uh, an outcome somewhere in between the maximum Germany uh, uh, claim that Germany made and the uh, much uh, smaller entitlement that Denmark and the Netherlands had initially gone for. So questions that were left with after, re or that I'm left with after rereading the North Sea Continental Shelf cases. Um, firstly, I want to know, is the Continental Shelf a legal or geographical feature? Secondly, does that distinction matter? And if it does, why? And thirdly, what does it mean for our understanding of the relationship between law and space more generally? So I'm gonna go through those three questions in turn. So first of all, is the continental shelf a legal or, ge or a geographical feature? To answer that question, I want to inquire into the history of the continental shelf. And since I'm interested in spatial and material effects of international law, this has to be a historical materialist account. By that I mean, what are the material conditions that led to the development of the idea of the continental shelf in the first place? The key context for me is the exploitation of the resources of the continental shelf, and so from that, the development of offshore drilling. So offshore drilling began in 1897 on a Santa Barbara beach in California. Uh, the offshore 
uh, wells, as you can see from this uh, photograph, were connected to the land by a 300 foot long wooden pier. Uh, a man named Henry Williams was the first person to drill for oil underneath the sea. At these distances, even at that time, I think we can uh, safely assume that nobody would argue that the United States did not have sovereignty over the land below the water. In 1911, Shell built these rigs on a lake in Louisiana, and these didn't have piers. These are the first freestanding um, offshore, if you uh, or not not on land, um, oil oil rigs. 1938 sees the establishment of the first oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico, about a mile offshore. And by 1947, they were digging wells 10 miles out to sea. Today, the world's most isolated oil platform is Shell's Pedido platform in the Gulf of Mexico, nearly 200 nautical miles from land and at 8,000 feet of depth. What's worth noting is that in the history of offshore oil, it's depth which is emphasized, not distance from shore. This makes intuitive sense to me as the challenges of drilling increase in line with depth, ever increasing pressure, turbulence, stresses on materials. The difficulties of being far from shore are not that much more if you're 100 nautical miles or 200 nautical miles, simply the complexity of supply and transport. The distance from shore is much more prominent in non-industry perspectives. Close to shore operations pose a greater environmental threat to the coastline, for example, and have a much bigger effect on the local economy, such as the influence of North Sea oil on the development of the city of Aberdeen. The law's initial preference for understanding this regime in terms of distance from shore betrays a land-based ontology, while the oil platform builders and operators have a much more fluid or sea-based ontology. Um, that's drawing on sort of um, legal geography and political geography or ocean geography uh, terminology that might be a bit uh, opaque for a more uh, general audience, but there's a distinction between understanding sort of geography in terms of land and understanding geography in terms of uh, sea. So meanwhile for international lawyers. The term continental shelf uh, emerges slowly over the first, or, uh, at the start of the 20th century. We see the uh, terminology here in a kind of crude or simple uh, Google engram search. Um, so you've got a first rise, so steady rise as offshore drilling becomes a, becomes a technical possibility. Um, but there's no particular bump noticeable for the um, Hague um, codification conference discussions of this, but we do see uh, a clear Truman pro Proclamation rise leading to a Geneva Convention rise right through to a clearly associated UNCLOS uh, peak. Um, that's not necessarily definitive of the, the rise of the idea, but it gives us, us some indication. This uh, survey of oil prices kind of uh, very crudely maps onto uh, the, the data we see for the rise in the continental shelf. Um, and whilst again, this is much too crude to draw any, any real uh, conclusions, it indicates with you my, where my thinking's going on, on what drives the, the interest in these different things. The, um, Hang on, sorry, I've lost slightly my place in my notes. Here we go. Um, the, in terms of the etymology of the term, uh, the earliest use of it that I've found is so far is from 1888 in, a, in an academic paper on fish habitats published in the Scottish Geographical Magazine. The paper defines the term as meaning applied to the shallow portion of the continental shelf lying within the 100 fathom line, which is usually terminated seawards by a very abrupt descent to abyssal, sound, to abyssal soundings. The paper cites as authority one from the previous year on soundings required to, lay, required to lay underwater cables. But in that paper, the feature is at all times referred to as the continental slope without differentiating its different parts. The term appears sporadically in other readings at geographical meetings in the 1890s, and begins to appear more widely in scientific literature in the early 20th century in a variety of places, but mostly in geological surveys, particularly in the US, the Arctic and the Antarctic. At this time, it certainly hasn't established a specific technical meaning, 
still being interchangeable with continental slope and also seem to describe large land-based geographical features. The initial interest in the continental shelf seems to be related to fishing and to the laying of submarine cables, and that seems to be how it enters the scientific literature. So it enters separate, I think, to the, or potentially separate to the emergence of, of offshore drilling. It also has a different uh, legal origin story. So trying to looking at the just the emergence of the terminology of continental shelf is is one avenue I've pursued. But looking at the uh, legal history around offshore um, resources is, is another. Um, because the, the history of the, using the continental shelf or exploiting the resources of the continental shelf for energy um, goes back to a, to a similar point or even an, uh, an older point. The international law history of the continental shelf, I argue, starts with the Cornwall Submarine Mines Act of 1858, declaring ownership of minerals and workings from mines below the low tide mark adjacent to the coast of Cornwall as belonging to the Crown. The deeper Cornish mines went under the sea. Um, uh, so, sorry, deeper Cornish mines went out under the sea, and this led to technical developments such as the Cornish steam engine pump. A picture of one of these uh, steam engine pump houses is there, but the Cornish coast has lots of uh, these similar buildings that would pump out water from mines that went down under the sea, uh, under the water level. And this led to the need to develop the law as the Duchy of Cornwall, which is the property of the Prince of Wales uh, still, um, clashed with the crown um, over who belonged, over who owned the, the product of these mines. It was found by an arbitration um, in that case by a Sir John Patterson that the crown owned the land beyond the low water mark. The duchy argued first that the seabed which adjoined the county of Cornwall was passed to the duchy under the original grant of the land, and second, and in the alternative, that the seabed was unowned and thus belonged to the Prince of Wales as first occupier. Interestingly, at this time, the argument that the seabed, that the seabed was res nullius was not successful, and the decision of the arbitrator is reflected in the language of the Act, which in section two declared and enacted, second, no, it doesn't come up, uh, all mines and minerals lying below the low water mark under the open sea adjacent to but not being part of the county of Cornwall are as between the Queen's Majesty in the right of her crown on the one hand and His Royal Highness Albert Edward Prince of Wales and Duke of Cornwall in right of his duchy on Cornwall on the other hand vested in Her Majesty the Queen in right of her crown as part of the soil and territorial possessions of the crown. So that once you go past the low watermark, that build, that's the property of the crown. Not that it's unoccupied, but it is the property of the crown. There's no sort of limit placed on that, but it is in the context of mines that start in the county of Cornwall. This uh, arbitration, this dispute, this legislation was raised and discussed in the case of Aaron Keane in 1876. Um, this was a dispute about a ship crash and whether the uh, newly uh, combined courts, so the Admiralty Court had been brought into the Crown Court by this point, whether they had jurisdiction to criminally prosecute uh, somebody from a different state. So it's a, in some ways it's a proto-Lotus uh, case. Um, there are an early international law is full of these uh, issues of, of crashes between ships and trying to figure out jurisdiction. In um, trying to, in arguing that they did have jurisdiction, um, the um, some of the judges argued that this uh, this Cornish Mines Act showed that the Crown claimed authority and jurisdiction over the seabed, over the sea, and that therefore uh, criminal jurisdiction should and could extend. Um, however, that was the major that was the minority opinion of the judges. The majority judgment given by Lord G Chief Justice Cockburn proceeded along a different line of reasoning. He traced the development of the jurisdiction of the Admiralty Courts of case law where jurisdiction was claimed at sea since Edward I. There were two distinct lines of reasoning in the case. The judges who found jurisdiction relied on the opinion of international law scholars, while those who did not find jurisdiction relied on domestic case law. Cockburn dismissed Selden and Hale's extensive claims alongside others as vain and extravagant pretensions, 
where he relied on jurists, he traced a more modest line from Grotius of qualified jurisdiction at sea. Interestingly, he noted that Valen, in his commentary on French ordinances of 1681, claimed jurisdiction as far as the bottom of the sea can be found with a lead line. However, in 1923, it was still possible somehow for Cecil Hurst, writing in the British Yearbook of International Law, to claim that the, this mining legislation, this Cornish Mine Act, was the starting point for the authority of a state to claim ownership of the seabed. He was not convinced by Cockburn's argument in R. and Keane, finding that the only basis for this legislation was surely a belief that the Crown had territorial rights over the bed of the sea. His reading of the common law authority separated the question of territorial waters from the question of ownership of the seabed. Where Cockburn found no necessary connection between property in a couple of mines and the extension of criminal jurisdiction, Hurst read it, reads it the other way around. Quoting, the property in the bed of the sea and not merely sovereignty and jurisdiction over it was vested in the crown. Property in the bed of the sea has existed since people claimed exclusive fisheries beyond the low watermark. And as such, the rights of the crown in the bed of the sea must have been fixed at, at least as early as the 13th century. Compared to a three mile limit traced back to Binkershock in 1702, the English property in the bed of the sea is far more established. In the interim between Aaron Keane and Hearst's article, there'd been several decisions which accepted property in the seabed, mostly Privy Council decisions concerned with British colonies. He also extends the claim of property beyond three miles where the concern is sedentary fisheries. The right to these fisheries is a property right, and the ownership of the benefit is based on their being the produce of the soil. So having dismissed Resnolius' arguments for the seabed beyond the low watermark, it comes back in here in distinctly colonial usage, with title and property being derived from occupation, usage and enjoyment of the benefits. The areas in question are also largely in colonies. Furthermore, this is again a very distinctly land-based understanding of the sea. So that's our sort of uh, early history or early legal history of these arguments for, for claiming the seabed. Now, um, I'll jump forward slightly. So the Nitation Conference didn't really produce any outcome on the continental shelf, although preparatory materials noted that there was a, uni a unanimity about territory over at least the first three miles. The Truman Proclamations in 1945 gave this a new impetus. The most relevant and best known proclamation over the continental shelf has several interesting features. First, it situates the declaration in the context of the need to secure and exploit petroleum resources. Second, it uses the term continental shelf with no limits. The origin of title here is the seabed being contiguous. The proclamation also claims jurisdiction and control, but only over the resources of the seabed and subsoil. The second proclamation on fisheries is notable for the assertion of the power to regulate fishing activities on the high seas, whittling down the freedom of the high seas to navigation alone. Um, I'm going to skip slightly on the discussion of the reception of the proclamations and turn and bring in the Geneva Convention as well. Um, the Geneva Convention of 1958 defined the continental shelf on the basis of adjacency. It conferred sovereignty over resources with the only limit being that 200 meters depth or up to the depth that quote, admits of the exploitation of the natural resources. Whether there is significance in the difference between near syn synonyms contiguity in the Truman uh, terminology and adjacency in the Geneva Convention is hard to say. Depth as a limit, much as it was for the oil industry, is more interesting. Again, a part of a long line of extractivism driving the framing of the law in this area. So at this point, I think it's significant that 200 meters depth, as I said, when discussing the, the case. So my second question, does it matter if the continental shelf is simply a product of the law rather than, uh, the, than some kind of geographical fact? In this, I want to talk a bit about the history of the North Sea as an area, though I'm becoming a bit uh, conscious of time, Vito, so I, I might uh, skim this a little bit because it doesn't need a huge amount of depth 
Um, in the sort of prehistory of the North Sea, there's evidence for it as, uh, as an inhabited plain uh, before the end of the last ice age, so as, as an area that was physically lived on. Um, for Pliny, he called it the Northern Ocean. Uh, Ptolemy called it the Oceanum Germanicum. Uh, in Celtic, it was known as Morinaru, or the Dead Sea, which referred to the stillness of the North Sea. Um, this is an interesting question with the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles description of a sea that's filled with dragons and monsters and storms and um, people may be familiar with the description of, of the sort of dragons foretelling the coming of Vikings in, in, in northeastern England. Um, so Durham, where, where I'm from, is uh, very associated with, with Cuthbert and uh, Lindisfarne and the Lindisfarne Gospels talk about the dragons that populate the North Sea. Um, whereas also in an old English authority, um, Beowulf is full of people popping across the North Sea to, to go for a drink with each other as if it was just going for a stroll down the road. So the, the understanding of the ocean there is, is interesting. Um, in medieval English, it becomes an established uh, name as the, the German Ocean, um, which I think is a, is a poetic, if nothing else, contrast with the, the attempt to exclude Germany from the North Sea in these cases. Um, as we get closer to modernity, the emphasis, the naming, the, the understanding of the North Sea moves away from mobility to an emphasis on fishing. So something like the Danish sand toll of 1461 is um, arguably the first legislation or legal production of the North Sea. Um, that's a toll on uh, fishing boats landing on the beaches um, in Denmark. Uh, that's what a sand toll was. Uh, the breakup of the Hanseatic League and the rise of the Dutch herring bus and the Dutch dominance of herring fishing in the North Sea. Um, there's a, a strong argument to be made that the, uh, the, the famous sort of battle of the books uh, between uh, Grotius's uh, Mare Liberum and Selden's Mare Clausum was actually about herring fishery and who could control herring fishery as much as it was about um, colonial expansion and access to, to, to the spice trade and things. The English Navigation Acts are, a, are an accompaniment to the Anglo-Dutch Wars, but are, a, a, again, a legislative attempt by England to reassert uh, control or to, to, to assert itself in the North Sea. Um, that sort of, uh, well, I've gone, I've highlighted two navigation acts because of their uh, role in, in fermenting the Anglo-Dutch wars, but the English and then British navigation acts are passed well into the 19th century, uh, new versions. Um, before we get the North Sea Fisheries Convention in 1882, again, uh, agreeing between the different North Sea states how to manage fisheries, and something similar in the London Convention, Convention on Fisheries in 1964. So up to 1964, there's still this emphasis on fisheries in the, the legislation of the North Sea. The change from fishing to drilling comes around that point. So the first prospectors licensed to look for uh, mineral resources in the North Sea come from Denmark or a, or a, a Danish license in 1962. Um, German and Dutch exploratory wells are dug in 1963. The UK Continental Shelf Act, I already mentioned, of 1964. The first gas is discovered that same year. And oil, as I said, is discovered in 1969 after the, the, the cases. Um, okay, let me, for the conclusion, turn back to what I'm talking about here. Um, So, the, working through this history um, reveals that there's, as the use of the North Sea change, as the use of the resource changes, so do does its conceptualization and its legislation, the, the, the legal use of the, or the legal control of the sea. Um, this happened incredibly quickly in the, in the 1960s with the reorganization of the North Sea on the basis of seabed rather than surface um, and oil rather than fish. As demonstrated here, in different times, the sea was understood differently. In the pre-modern, it was primarily a way of traveling. In the early modern, as a fishing resource. And then very quickly in late modernity, the, the, the bed of the sea became the all important thing. 
The hydrocarbons contained under the continental shelf became the resource which dominates the understanding of the sea. Now I want to offer an explanation to conclude as to what directly ties legal change to changes in the mode of production. So the reason that, for example, the Vikings, whilst dominating the North Sea, did not colonize North America was that their mode of production was based on expanding the people included within a feudal or tributary network. The mercantilism of the early modern period required ever greater exploitation of fisheries for trade, and Dutch dominance of herring fisheries was the key reason for, the, for their growth and dominance as a trade hub for Baltic grain and timber with French and Iberian salt, oil and wine. Spanish and Portuguese gold and spices changed the dynamic again, and the involvement of the Dutch in imperialism in the East demanded a new assertion of the freedom of both fisheries and seas. As we see the emergence of capitalism, the law becomes more generalized as a tool of social organization. Freedom is not enough and property must be secured. On land, this is the key innovation of English imperialism. However, the change comes more slowly to the seas, the commodification of the seas really arises in the 20th century and the possibility of the exploitation of the resources of the continental shelf. The commodity form theory of law holds that law only becomes a universal system under capitalism. It is capitalism which turns specific goods into generalizable commodities with an abstract value. Everything has a value and everything can be exchanged. Law both creates and secures this abstract value. The abstractness of the continental shelf is clear in the way it is disassociated from the water, conceptualized as land which does not need occupying, and after UNCLOS is disconnected from any material definition, granted to every coastal state up to 200 nautical miles. International law in this understanding is structurally connected to imperialism. First, because the international legal form is bound up with the spread of international capitalism, and second, because only imperial violence can enforce international law. If all international law is tied up with imperialism, how does this play, play out in a dispute apparently limited to Northern Europe? As I mentioned at the start, prior to the case, the Netherlands and Denmark are uh, acutely concerned for their colonial territories, potential continental shelves. The preference for negotiation and equity hands over the enforcement to the formally equal states. But states are only formally equal under international law. The force behind the states is the actual enforcement. So the decision of the International Court of Justice <clears throat> reiterates a fundamental feature of international law. Strong states winning over weak states. Imperialism baked in, even in something as strict and worked out as the continental shelf would seem to be. There is also an ideological function to the ICJ decision and the evolution of the continental shelf regime. The ideological function of the entire law of the sea regime takes several forms. First, it legitimates the exploitation of marine resources and the enclosure of massive swathes of marine territory. The formality of UNCLOS dissimulates, hiding relations of domination behind a universal and formally equal treaty. The universality of UNCLOS unifies the social relations at work here, making the system seem peaceful and coherent, whilst also reifying a set of norms that are historically contingent and specific. It also naturalizes the system which separates out different zones and areas which in material reality cannot be separated. The law in this area is both symptomatic of international law more generally, but also a vanguard of the development of late neoliberal international law. We see in the North Sea the production of a new commodity, the separating of the seabed from the water column and from the environment in general, and the treating of the submarine as land and the disconnection of the living and the non-living. To say this is ideological is not to say that it is false or carried out in ignorance. Far from it, at every stage, key participants knew what they were doing, they knew its impacts, and they knew the effects which were hidden. I think I have another bit which I will leave aside and say that the North Sea Continental Shelf cases construct the ocean as flat, empty and easily divided into different separate zones. It doesn't take much ontological questioning to see that to separate the seabed from the water above it, to prioritise its connection to the land beside it, is a peculiar way to understand the sea. 
But putting this in the context of critical oceans thinking, we see this as using law to respond to a specific oceanic anxiety, the very fluidity, the smooth and deterritorializing effect of the ocean. Law's very abstractness and the abstracting force makes it the perfect necessary tool for rendering the oceans comprehensible for exploitation, not just as flat surface for movement, but also the seabed for mining, life forms for biotechnical research, etc. The oceans are a generative space for law as commodity producer and commodity guarantor. The ocean as commodity and the law as commodifier are co-constitutive, and as I've sought to demonstrate elsewhere, original and generative. This is how the law makes space and how space makes law. To undo or to remake either is to remake both. Thank you. I hope that didn't go on too long. I'll stop sharing my screen as well. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Henry, for this really interesting uh, presentation. And um, now the floor is open for questions uh, or comments. And uh, as I said earlier, if you please can put write your comments in the chat and I'll read read them up uh, for um, for Henry. And let me open the chat. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Um, you know what? I'll do. I'll do this. 